A young boy and his father are walking along a path in the forest, and they come across a large branch on the ground. The young boy looks to his father and says, Dad, do you think I can move that branch? The father says, Yes. If you use all of your strength, I think you can. The young boy tries to move the branch and is unable to do it. He looks to his father disappointed and says, Dad, you were wrong. I can't do it. The father says, Try again. If you use all of your strength, I think you can do it. The young boy tries again to move the branch and is unable to do it. He looks to his father and says, Dad, you were wrong. I can't do it. The father says, Son, I advise you to use all of your strength. You didn't. You didn't ask for my help. Like the young boy, I approached life independently. I thought that being independent meant I was strong, self-sufficient, and I always had a positive connotation with it. And I thought that it was the only way to be successful, was to be independent. I was gradually gaining my independence. I got my driver's license, so I got to go wherever I wanted, whatever I wanted. I graduated from high school, went on to college, lived in the dorms, joined a fraternity, studied, sometimes. <laughs> Moved to an apartment, got a part-time job, paid my bills, went grocery shopping, cooked, if you blue top ramen. But I really enjoyed all that and still had time to play my favorite sport, probably the most independent of them all, golf. <laughs> Just over eight years ago, when I was a 19-year-old sophomore in college, I remember I was walking around on campus one day and I noticed I had to squint to read a sign. For me, that was abnormal because I had perfect 20-20 vision my whole life. So I did what any other 19-year-old in college would do in this situation. I called my mom. <laughs> I said, hey, Mom, I think I need glasses or contacts. I'm not sure which. Do you accept an optometrist appointment? Let me know what it is. Call me back on the box. That's how I talked to my mom. I went and saw the optometrist the day before Thanksgiving 2008, and he ran the normal test on me. I'm sure you've all done it. What do you see better with? One or two? Two or three? Three or four? And everything was routine until he had me cover my left eye. When I covered my left eye, I couldn't see anything on the eye chart. I couldn't even see the baby. Okay, maybe I'm going to need some thick glasses. <laughs> when you look at athletes and celebrities these days, they're wearing those thick glasses and they're making them look cool. So I thought I could wear those glasses and go back to school, still be accepted by my friends, not a problem. But the optometrist just wasn't as optimistic as I was. He said, Jeremy, I need to run some more tests on you. I need to call your parents in, and we need to discuss what's going on. I go do some more tests, go back in his office, both my parents are in the room. He says, Jeremy, I think you have one of two things. He said, I think you either have something that's called a pituitary adenoma, which to this day I have no idea what that is. <laughs> or he said, Jeremy, I think you might have a brain tumor. I went and got an MRI done to check and see if I had a brain tumor on Thanksgiving Day. And I thankfully found out I did not have a brain tumor. But over the next two months, my family and I went on what we call a medical mystery tour. We went and saw multiple different doctors, and I was misdiagnosed with several different disorders. I had a catheter in my hand for five days. They bumped steroids into me every single day, so that would help. I got a spinal tap done. They stick a large needle in your back, drain fluids, and run tests on that. Then I had a catheter in my jugular, cords dangling out of my neck. I would lay in a hospital bed every other day for 10 days as they did a treatment that they said would help. Unfortunately, these were all misdiagnoses for disorders doctors thought I had, but it didn't. And in this two month span, my vision drastically deteriorated and spread from just my right eye to both eyes. And it went from perfect 2020 vision to where it is now. I'm now legally blind with no central vision due to a rare genetic disorder I had no idea I had called Labor's Hereditary Optic Neuropathy, or LHON. <coughs> I 
not only show what happens to one in 50,000 people. Only about 100 people in the U.S. are diagnosed with it each year. And unfortunately, it has no treatment and no cure. So my vision and perspective for you, what does it mean to have no central vision? If you could for me, please, put both of your hands together like this, put them directly in front of your face. And look around the room a little bit with your hands directly in front of your face like that. That's what my vision is like at all times. As you can see on the screen, it's a good depiction of what my vision is like. On the left, it's perfect 2020 vision when I have the first 19 years of my life. On the right, so my vision's been like the last eight years now. I'm no longer able to read. Imagine going on a date with a woman you're trying to impress. You have to ask her to read you the menu like you're five years old. I'm no longer able to drive. I had to hand my car keys back to my parents at 19 years old and forfeit the independence of driving. And I'm no longer able to distinguish faces. Do you know how tough it is to know someone for years, and then all of a sudden, you have to ask who it is and swallow your pride every time you see them, because you can't recognize them. All of a sudden, the world of independence was gone. And it seemed like the only alternative was dependence. I used to be able to go wherever I wanted, whenever I wanted. After losing my sight, I was afraid to leave my house because I had to cross the street on my own. Tasks that were easy when I could see were now more difficult than ever. Like going to the grocery store. I couldn't distinguish any of the items on the shelves. And then suddenly, I was a millennial who couldn't even use his own phone. I was so fearful of becoming dependent on others. I thought people would never see me as normal again. I'd be looked at as damaged goods. People would pity me. I would never be seen as a true man. And I was afraid that I would never be truly happy ever again. At this point, school for me was an afterthought. I didn't want to go back to college. I wanted to drop out. But one of my best friends, Josh, he called me. He said, Jeremy, come back to school and take two easy classes. And in my five class schedule, I'll take those same two classes with you. And that's exactly what he did. I came back to school the following semester. I didn't miss a semester. But I took two easy classes. I took intro to music and intro to film. That was my class schedule. I had intro to film for a blind guy was actually a lot tougher than I expected. <laughs> I showed up the first day of class and Josh was sitting in the front row. I'm like, all right, I'll find a way to get through this little college thing. The professor says, welcome to intro to film. Thank you for signing up for my course. For those who want to appreciate the best type of films, you have to see the best cinema, or silent films. Here's an hour and a half to try to That was my nightmare. <laughs> Thankfully, the class was not intro to silent films. They got a lot better after that. But Josh took the same two classes with me in his five class schedule. He helped me walk to and from class. He helped me tell the professor that I was legally blind and I needed accommodations. And he helped me study for the exams in the classes, which helped me pass those classes. What Josh did for me was monumental. It was life changing. I graduated from college with a degree in business in 2013, and I know this would not have been possible had it not been for what Josh did for me. For the longest time, I thought I was the only one benefiting from all of this. But one day, I remember walking around with Josh and saying, I'm sorry you took two easy classes to help me. I know I'm a bird. And his response was, you're not a bird. You're a blessing. And I thought, what the heck is he talking about? <laughs> what could he be getting out of this? But that was the first moment that I thought, there may be something more than just being independent or dependent. Growing up, I was an athlete. I loved sports. My favorite sport was golf. I played three 
career is worse than in high school. I was especially devastated after losing my sight to think I could never play the game I love ever again. My mom was incredible. She came up to me one day and she said, Jeremy, Jeremy, there's such a thing as the U.S. PGA, the United States Line Ball Association. And these golfers first playing tournaments all over the world. And I thought, Mom, that's really cute. <laughs> I thought she was kidding, telling me a joke to boost my spirit. She did a good job of it, but I didn't think she was serious. But there is such thing as blind golf, and there are tournaments all over the world. Now, you can't go drop me off to the local golf course and say, well, I want Jeremy. But every single blind golfer is a guy. Someone else is out on every single shot. And for me, that was an easy choice. My dad. And that's my guy in every competitive round of blind golf that we play in. As you can see in the photo, what he does is he points in the direction I want to hit the shot. I try to envision where he's pointing, I have no clue where he's pointing. <laughs> I step over the shot, and from behind he looks at my line and says, go a little more right, a little more left, okay, you're good. And I hit the shot, and we do that the whole way around the course. We just got back from Japan, where we competed in and won the 2016 World Blind Golf Championship. Thank you so much. It was an incredible experience, and we achieved our goal. It was unbelievable, but in that moment, I remember noticing my dad getting just as much satisfaction out of the whole experience as I was. It made me think back to Josh. Maybe this is the blessing. Maybe the gift is the power of interdependence. Maybe we have it wrong in our society where we place so much emphasis on independence. Independence is good. Interdependence is great. With interdependence, I want us all to feel more comfortable in asking for help and asking others if they need help. Because think about how it makes you feel when someone asks you for your help. You feel special, wanted, needed. Why don't we ask others for help more? Because we're afraid of feeling vulnerable or coming off as dependent. Now that I'm able to see the power of interdependence, I've noticed that my relationships are deeper than ever before. That the interactions I have with those around me, we have more purpose in our lives. And when we live interdependently, it leads to increased success. I can honestly say, I'm happier today at 27 years old, legally blind, living interdependently, than I was at 19 years old, fully sighted, trying to be as independent as possible. Because let me tell you, when we're able to embrace interdependence in our lives, it opens our eyes to see things we may have never seen before. And what I want from all of you, like the young boy in the forest with his father, is to learn to use all of your support network, to be strong, strong enough to ask for help.